Over the past two days, I have completed Pokemon Yellow using only a Bulbasaur and only a Charmander. So today, I'm going to beat the game using the final starter, Squirtle. Playthrough rules are in the description. This video will have spoilers for both Bulbasaur and Charmander, so check those videos out first if you haven't seen them. Alright, so let's get started. For base stats, Squirtle has 44 HP, 48 attack, 65 defense, 50 special, and 43 speed giving it an 8.2% chance to crit in Generation 1. Like all starters, it has a medium-slow growth rate, which is fast to level up in the early game and slows down later on. As I've said before in all of these videos, this is the best growth rate for a solo challenge, so Squirtle is set up for success. Not to mention it is a water-type Pokémon, and that's going to be fantastic against Brock in the early game. It starts with Tackle and Tail Whip, and then at only level 8 gets Bubble. At level 15 it gets Water Gun, Bite at 22, and Withdraw at level 28. This move can be used to trigger the badge boost glitch by raising Squirtle's defense. You'd think that Skull Bash, which it learns at level 35, could also be used for the badge boost glitch, but unfortunately in this generation, Skull Bash has no secondary effect. On turn 1 it just does nothing and then attacks on turn 2. Through TM and HM, Squirtle gets access to Mega Punch, Body Slam, Bubble Beam, Water Gun, Ice Beam, Blizzard, all three of the fighting type moves, Dig, and Surf. I think the move that makes most sense to highlight out of these is Dig. In Generation 1, it has base 100 power, and it counters one of Squirtle's primary weaknesses, Electric type Pokemon. For its other weakness, which is Grass Pokemon, it has access to Ice Beam and Blizzard. When I sat down to do this miniseries, I figured that the rankings would mirror what I found when I used their final forms. It is worth noting, of course, that that video is very old now. I definitely am going to re-explore the final stage starters at some point in the future. That being said, I thought that Squirtle would be the best of the first stages, with Bulbasaur being second and Charmander being third. So far with our rankings, it seems like that is playing out. Bulbasaur was significantly faster than Charmander and much easier to use. So can Squirtle do it? Will it be the best first stage starter to solo run the game with? Well, let's find out. In runs like this, I feel that it's important to address minimum battles because there will be a lot of questions about that. Squirtle could beat the rival in the lab and then beat the mandatory bug catcher in Viridian Forest, taking it up to level 8 where it learns Bubble, then I could just stomp Brock and move on to Route 3. My format for these videos is always showing my first playthrough with the Pokémon, and then showing subsequent playthroughs where I try to refine my results as much as is possible. In this first run, I didn't think it was the best choice to go through minimum battles at this stage in the game. It usually makes things very difficult for Water-type Pokémon on Route 3. What happens is you give up all of your time in that area of the game, rather than just training here in Viridian Forest. If you want to see a good example of that, please go and check out my old Poliwag video, because that thing really struggled on Route 3 when it didn't do training. When I clear the mandatory bug catcher, my Squirtle is level 12, and so I head into Brock's gym, get some quick experience against the junior trainer here, and now Squirtle is ready for its first gym battle. Obviously Squirtle is based on a turtle, so it's quite slow, meaning it is going to move second against the Onyx. That being said, even if it uses Bide, it's never going to pay back damage because Bubble is going to two-shot for sure. In this case, I take the Onyx to a sliver with one hit and finish it on the next turn. Squirtle's first split is 4 minutes and 44 seconds. Interestingly enough, if we compare this with Charmander, the Fire-type was able to beat Brock faster. Not by much, only 21 seconds, but that just comes down to the fact that Ember is better for training in Viridian Forest. Squirtle using Tackle, or Bubble even, does not knock out the bugs particularly fast. After all, Bubble, with the same type attack bonus, only has an effective power of 30, whereas Tackle has an effective power of 35. And now that Squirtle has the badge boost from Brock's badge, it's a attack stat is slightly higher than its special stat. As a result on Route 3, I'm going to be using primarily Tackle for my damage. Also, if the Pokémon here lower my stats, it triggers the badge boost glitch to compound my attack stat, raising it even higher, allowing Squirtle to deal more damage. But this all shifts by the time I reach the final Pokémon on the first Bug Catcher's team, because Squirtle has learnt Water Gun by this point, and this move has an effective power of 60, so it's going to be doing more damage than Tackle, plus it's more reliable with 100% accuracy. In Mount Moon, I'm going to fight some optional trainers to level up. I want to be a decent level by the time I reach Cerulean City. It would be really great if Squirtle could beat Misty before the rival, so I have access to Bubble Beam for the extended portion of the game that is Nugget Bridge. There are so many mandatory trainers there, and anything you can do to speed up that progress really helps with your final result. When Squirtle takes out Jesse and James's Meowth, it levels up to 21, I finish off the coughing, and now it's time for Cerulean City. 
My first destination is the gym, so I have to fight the junior trainer that blocks Misty. I call her the pecking junior trainer because the Goldeen likes to use peck, but it also has supersonic and tail whip. And Squirtle hits itself twice, going down to 11 hit points. I can't do very much damage to this water type. Tackle just barely doesn't knock it out. Squirtle hits itself again. And yeah, that is my first loss of the run. In this case, I'm going to take the blackout because I did not save in front of this battle. I actually haven't saved once in this run, so I would have to restart if I reset. To do better damage to water type Pokemon, I teach Squirtle Bide in the place of Bubble. I'm keeping Tail Whip just in case it's useful in combination with Tackle against Misty. Now as I face the junior trainer again, one thing I should mention about Bide is if you hit yourself in confusion, Bide gets cancelled, so in this fight I still have to rely on Tackle. Luckily this time Squirtle doesn't get confused, so it's easily able to take out the Goldeen. With that victory, it's ready to face Misty. She has AI Modification 3, which means her Water-type Pokémon are never going to choose Water-type moves against my Squirtle. As a result, the Staryu is always going to be using Tackle, or Misty will use an X Defend on it. That means I can use Bide to accumulate damage and pay it back to the Staryu double. The cost of this is half of my HP, and that's not encouraging. That being said, when I defeat the Staryu, Squirtle levels up to 22, and here it can learn the move Bite, which by the way in Generation 1 is a normal type move, so it isn't super effective against the Starmie, but it does a lot more damage than Tackle. I was kicking myself here for not leveling up a little bit more in Mount Moon just so I could have this move right from the start of the fight, then I never would have trapped myself into using Bide against the Staryu. I think in retrospect that was a mistake. That being said, Misty is really setting up Starmie's defense, and then my fourth Bite gets a critical hit, bypassing the stat changes, taking it down to orange health. And my fifth Bite gets another crit, finishing the Starmie off, so Squirtle wins on its first attempt. It really shouldn't have. The prize for winning is the TM for Bubble Beam, which I immediately teach to Squirtle in the place of Tail Whip. With this powerful water type move, I think I'm going to sweep the rival's team with great ease. I take the Spearow to red health in one hit, knock it out, of course the Sandshrew is a one hit. He sends in Rattata, which could have used Quick Attack, but it doesn't, so I just polish it off, move on to his ace, and I two hit it. This is sort of a tortoise versus the hare race. In this case, it's more like the turtle versus the lizard and the frog, but hopefully you'll get my point after a small explanation. Bulbasaur really struggled in the early game fighting random Pokemon, and then in the late game, once it gained access to Swords Dance, and Sleep Powder, it just sweeps through the game, having to do very few optional battles. Charmander is sort of the reversed case, where at the beginning of the game it comes out strong, sweeping through all of the random trainers, and not really having any problems against Brock. However, then things really slow down in the mid-game as it has to prepare for Lance's Gyarados. So both of those Pokémon have the section of the game where they move very quickly, and then they kind of slow down in the other section of the game. This is like the hare running really fast and then having a nap. Whereas with Squirtle, while it does have access to Bubble Beam right now, this actually does not make it go that fast. Plus, it doesn't gain access to any other moves that are really going to accelerate its progress significantly. Withdraw is nice for the badge boost glitch, but setting it up takes time. Ice Beam gives good coverage, but Squirtle doesn't have a particularly high special stat, so it still might not be one-hitting key targets. Dig is great, but it's also slow because it takes two turns in battle. So for that reason, it really does feel like Squirtle is the tortoise. It just kind of moves slowly throughout all the sections of the game, and perhaps that is going to give it the win at the very end of all of this. After saving Bill from his freaky experiment, I defeat the rocket outside of Cerulean City and teach Squirtle Dig in the place of Bide. Bubble is able to one-shot Sandy's Pidgeys, so there's no problems here, and I head into the SSN. To be safe in my first playthrough, I'm going to pick up the TM for Rest. While I'm fighting the trainer that guards it, Squirtle levels up to 28, and I'm going to teach Withdraw now. This is kind of a disadvantage that it comes so early for Squirtle, because it's going to sit around on my moveset and not really be useful until later in the game. After all, the badge boost glitch only boosts stats that already have the badge that modifies them, so I'm only going to be boosting my attack with the glitch right now if I use this move. I'll have to wait until I defeat Koga and then Blaine to gain the boosts to both my speed and special. Of course, Withdraw is going to modify my defense so it doesn't cause the boost to glitch out on this stat. The next order of business is teaching Squirtle Body Slam in the place of Bite, then I grab the rare candy and face the rival. Because this fight is usually really easy, I like to review my Pokémon's moveset at this point in the run. Squirtle has Bubble Beam, Dig, Withdraw, and Body Slam. That is a fantastic set, and I honestly think Squirtle is going to have a similar set throughout most of the game. It's probably the case that Bubble Beam will be switched for Surf and Body Slam for Ice Beam later on. For now though, these moves are exactly what I need, I defeat the rival, and now let's take on Surge.
Squirtle might have super effective damage in the form of Dig, but I think it's going to two hit, and if the Raichu uses Thunderbolt, Squirtle is likely going to go down. Instead, turn one, it goes for Mega Kick, which does almost half. Raichu gets an X speed while I'm underground, Dig hits, taking it to red health, but that means it's going to get one more attack in. In this case, it goes for Mega Punch, getting a critical hit, but Squirtle hangs on on five hit points, uses Body Slam, and knocks the electric mouse out. With this victory, my water type now has to face the wrapping lass. Of course I'm going to save before this battle, I do want to remind everyone that very recently we did Starmie vs Tentacruel, and the water psychic type really struggled in this battle specifically because it didn't have access to any reliable normal damage to knock her grass types out to avoid stun spore. I think this is an interesting comparison because you would expect Starmie to be a much more capable Pokemon, especially because its move pool gives it so much coverage. Squirtle might have less, but it gets the moves it needs earlier on, so I have Dig and Body Slam here. Dig is neutral against the Oddish, which takes it to red health. It does not use Stun Spore, and it can use Body Slam to knock it out. To be safe against the second Oddish, I take my time setting up Withdraw on the Bellsprout. This is badge boosting my attack stat. I really want Dig to one-hit the Oddish so that it doesn't use stun spore. And that is exactly what plays out. I move on to the final bell sprout and easily one shot it. Inside of Rock Tunnel, the Pokemaniacs aren't going to be a problem, but they're going to be slow because they have Slowpoke on their team. The status condition junior trainer was problematic with Starmie as well, but with Squirtle she isn't, once again because this little Squirtle has access to Body Slam as well as Dig, although I didn't use the latter move in this fight. The self-destructing hikers team is a series of three one-hits, and with that Squirtle has made it to Celadon City. The first thing to do here is explore the rocket hideout, primarily to pick up one extra rare candy. There are two secondary benefits. The first one is that I gain experience fighting two trainers in this area. The second one is that I get more items that I can sell in the department store for additional money. On the top floor I buy a fresh water, I trade it to this girl to gain TM13, which is Ice Beam, and then I purchase vitamins, in this case for Calcium, which is going to raise my special stat. I figured this was the best choice for Squirtle. Its speed is pretty bad, I didn't really want to invest more in this stat, plus having a higher speed special attack is just going to make it hit harder throughout the rest of the mid game. During the next rival fight, let's talk about Ice Beam. Teaching this move right now would give me super effective damage against Firo, plus would give Squirtle the option to fight Erika if it wanted to get a little bit risky. I just don't think I'm going to have the damage ranges needed at this current level. In comparison with Bubble Beam, Ice Beam has 95 base power, whereas Bubble Beam has an effective power of 97 after the same type attack bonus, so these two moves are roughly equivalent. Now, Bubble Beam has a 33% chance to lower speed, whereas Ice Beam has a 10% chance to freeze. Obviously, the Ice move has the better secondary effect. The other comparison to make is between Body Slam and Dig. While Dig takes two turns, it does do more damage, and the only Pokemon that it can't hit are Flying types, so Body Slam isn't really offering any useful coverage that Dig doesn't already take care of. Plus, if I had Ice Beam in the place of Body Slam, I would have already covered Flying types. I don't need a physical move to do that. Thinking through all of this, I think it's obvious that the choice should be to teach Ice Beam in the place of Body Slam right away when you receive the TM, but in this first playthrough, I hadn't gone through all of that logic, and I was acting emotionally, slightly scared that giving up Body Slam would cause problems for Squirtle. Yeah, anyways, that's a mistake. But don't worry, it's not a critical mistake. As you've seen, the rival was very easy. Next is Agatha Jr. Squirtle outspeeds all the Ghastlies and Dig is super effective, so the Chandler and Pokemon Tower aren't an issue for it. And now we're going to jump into footage against the Ghost in Pokemon Tower. Um, yes, I'm going to use the Pokedoll to clear it, that is how I play these Generation 1 solo challenges. Overall, I like making the Rocket Hideout an optional area. I find these challenges are more interesting that way. Now the reason I'm showing you this footage is because once I clear the ghost, I go upstairs, and I immediately walk right into the battle with Jesse and James. That footage was unedited, I did not take out a save there to make the footage more beautiful for all of you, and as a result I want to bring us back to what I was saying before. Not having Ice Beam is not a critical mistake, but not saving in front of Jesse and James is a critical mistake. The Meowth is really annoying because it's fast, it uses Growl lowering my attack stat, so now Dig and Body Slam are going to be doing significantly less damage. Also, my Bubble Beam doesn't one-hit their lead, so it uses Screech lowering my defense. Then the Arbok is faster than Squirtle by one speed, it hits Glare, paralyzing me before I go underground for Dig. Now using a two-turn move when you are paralyzed or confused feels awful. 
It isn't an issue against the Arbok, it lands one bite before going down, then Weezing comes out, hits Smog for a little bit, I'm using Bubble Beam because my special hasn't been lowered, it does about a third, Weezing goes for Smog again, taking Squirtle under half health with a critical hit, I take it to orange health, and then Weezing uses Sludge, knocking Squirtle out. My last save was in front of the rival at the beginning of Pokemon Tower. Because of this, the fastest way to proceed is going to be to faint all of my HM users and black out. By the way, it's a little bit weird here that I also have an HM user Squirtle. If you're wondering why, I just don't want to have strength on the same Pokemon that knows Dig. Digging out of Victory Road when you are about to go up against the League is one of the most painful things in the world, so I always grab Squirtle even if I don't need it, just so that I don't make that mistake. In the rematch against Jesse and James, things still are not particularly good. The only difference is that this time my attack stat wasn't lowered, and that gives me better damage against both the Arbok and the Weezing, because I can use Dig. I might have lost here a second time if the Weezing had gone for Sludge again and got a critical hit, or a significantly better damage roll. But it didn't, so Squirtle emerges victorious. On Cycling Road, I make sure to pick up the rare candy, and then I head into the Safari Zone, where I can get the HM for Surf. With some water types like Starmie, it doesn't make sense to teach this move, because there's no move deleter in Generation 1, but with Squirtle, I don't think that its moveset is diverse enough to pass it up. So I teach Surf in the place of Bubble Beam, and now Squirtle has its best offensive move. In Saffron on City, I face the Fighting Dojo trainers as well as a bunch of trainers in Sylph, bringing Squirtle to level 42 before I face the rival. This is the first battle where he is truly a challenge. Note here, I have taught Squirtle Ice Beam in the place of Body Slam. Because I didn't think I was going to one-hit the Magneton with Dig, I decided to set up Withdraw to badge boost my attack stat as much as is possible. That being said, I didn't want to go too far into this because the Sand Slash can use Sand Attack or it can use Slash and do a lot of damage. I finish it off with a Surf and move on to the Cloister. Because of AI Modification 3, this thing is only going to spam Super Sonic against water types. It just misses and I knock it out without getting confused. Okay, so it's time for Magneton. This electric type is notorious in my playthroughs, especially when I'm using water types. I go for Dig and with two badge boosts, no, of course it does not knock it out. Luckily though, I trigger the rare potion from the rival, so I am able to knock it out without taking any damage. Cadaver's next, it's faster than Squirtle, Confusion does a little bit, but not enough to KO, and I knock it out. All that's left is Flareon, I probably should have gone for Surf against it, Dig does not get the one hit, and I have my accuracy lowered by Sand Attack, but Surf is able to knock it out on the next turn anyways. After that, I finish Giovanni off, and Sylph is complete. With Squirtle nearing level 45, I figured that it was safe to go back to Erica's gym and face the Grass-type specialist. Now, I filmed this playthrough on August 29th, so I was still doing training in Erica's gym at that point, and today this is very relevant. If you've seen my Drowsy livestream from last December, you will know what the risk is when you're training here. In Generation 1, every single move has a 1 in 256 chance to miss. This is commonly referred to as the Gen 1 miss, and in this case, if it happens when you're facing one of the Bellsprout line, they can use Stun Spore on you, and typically the trainers here know when your Pokemon has a non-volatile status condition, and then they'll use attacking moves. Turns out these Bellsprout only have Wrap. So yeah, I Gen 1 miss with Ice Beam, failing to knock the Bellsprout out, it uses Stun Spore, paralyzing Squirtle, and then begins to use Wrap. Because of this thing's moveset, there is no chance for it to use another move, so what I need to wait for is the moment when Wrap misses. This is a 15% chance, so eventually it will happen. One consolation here is the fact that Squirtle has high defense and is very overleveled, so each hit from Wrap is only dealing 2 damage. Since this is her second Bellsprout, I figured that staying in the fight, just waiting for the miss and then knocking the Bellsprout out, was going to be the fastest way to proceed with the playthrough. If I reset, then I have to go back to the first trainer in the gym, because I didn't save in front of this beauty. I know the decision I made here was reasonable, but the game is really unreasonable. It just keeps hitting, never missing, and knocks Squirtle out. Okay, so that is a third really annoying failure for Squirtle. By the way, I'm just going to skip over all the footage of the trainers in Erica's gym. Of course, this situation didn't play out again. So let's jump into the Erica battle. Tangle is her lead. I go for Ice Beam, and it knocks it out in one hit. All right, so this is going to be an easy sweep. Weeping Bell goes down, and Gloom does too. And with that, Squirtle has earned itself its fourth badge. Inside the Fuchsia City gym, I want to talk about pacing. The early three gym leaders were fairly evenly spaced. Then there was a long time before I faced Erica. And now the final gym leaders are all going to come in quick succession for Squirtle. After defeating the two mandatory trainers in this gym at level 47, I figured I was ready to give Koga a first try.
I'm going into this fight with Squirtle poisoned. That's specifically so the first Venonat and the third Venonat cannot use Sleep Powder against me. Because of Koga's AI, he is going to prioritize the Grass type move whenever I don't have a status condition. However, with Poison, I'm only taking 1 16th damage per turn, and this gives me the time I need to use Surf to knock the Venonats out. Also, in Generation 1, on the turn you knock the opponent's Pokemon out, you don't take Poison damage, so I can make it to the Venomoth with green health. Of course, it's faster than my Turtle, it hits Psychic doing a lot, and then my Surf does about a third. Alright, this is not gonna work out. I thought perhaps a better strategy was using Ice Beam against the Venonats in the hopes that it would eventually freeze them, and then I could set up with Withdraw for free. I don't get any freezes in my first attempt, so that's a second loss to Koga, and I also don't get any freezes in my third attempt. In the fourth fight, I have worse results, which convince me that now I need to go and do some training. I backtrack to Cycling Road, I really wish I had fought the trainers here the first time I had come through, and then at level 50, I head back to face Koga again. Still, Surf is not getting a one hit on the first Venonat. Also, since I did the training, I'm no longer poisoned, so the second Venonat uses Toxic on Squirtle, and that is much worse than just regular poison. By the way, there is a way in Generation 1 to make bad poison into good poison. You can switch your Pokemon out and then send it back in. This will revert the status back to regular poison, just because bad poison is stored as a flag in the active Pokemon's battle ram, so when you switch it out, this flag is cleared and it doesn't go with your Pokemon into the party. That being said, this is a solo run, so switching out is strictly not allowed. While I make it to the Venomoth, I'm doing awful damage because of a special drop from Psychic, so once again Squirtle gets another loss. Up until now, things have not been bad, but this is the first wall I have run into. I have one more loss, then I train to level 51, and use four rare candies to bring Squirtle up to level 55, over two more damage rounding thresholds. This should give me the one hit on the first Venonat, well, I got a critical hit, so I did get it either way. I didn't think I would get the one hit on the second Venonat, so I go for Ice Beam. It luckily missed this is toxic and I take it out for free. Next is the third Venonat. I just decided to go for Surf to see how much damage it was doing, and it just barely hangs on, luckily missing Sleep Powder, and I knock it out. Because of all of this luck, my Squirtle is arriving at the Venomoth with green health. This situation is perfect. I go for Surf, getting a critical hit, taking the Venomoth down to red health. I think even with a critical hit from Psychic, it wouldn't be able to finish me now, so finally Squirtle has defeated Koga and earned itself a speed boost. Everyone who's sensitive to visual stuff, just look away for a moment because I'm going to go into Cinnabar Island. In here is the TM for Blizzard, I'm going to pick this up because in Generation 1 it has 90% accuracy, and I can see it being useful for Squirtle if it needs more damage at the end of the game. Inside of Blaine's Gym, for some more experience, I fight all of the trainers. This takes Squirtle almost up to level 57, and now I'm ready to take on the Fire-type Specialist. Theoretically, this fight should be very easy, however, in the past, it has been hard with some water types, just because Blaine's Pokemon hit very hard with physical moves, plus the fact that the Ninetales can confuse you, lower your defense with Tail Whip, and the Rapidash can lower your attack stat. Luckily for me, I'm relying on Special. Surf is just not quite enough to one-hit both the Ninetales and the Rapidash, but I've taken so little damage by the time the Arcanine comes out, this is basically a foregone conclusion. While it does do lots of damage, it isn't enough. On my way to the Saffron Gym, I pick up the TM for Mimic, and then I face Sabrina. I'm fighting her after Blaine, so Squirtle has the special boost from the Volcano Badge, plus I have exactly 103 speed, so I am tied with her first Abra. I move first, allowing Squirtle to knock it out in one hit. Next is Kadabra. I decide to go for Withdraw here because it both boosts my attack and my speed so that I can move first against it. The cost of attempting this is being hit by Kinesis having my accuracy lowered, but I'm still able to finish off her second Pokemon and move on to the Alakazam. When I go underground, it uses Reflect, and then Dig does less than half. It strikes back with Psychic, but surprisingly does very little, however it does lower my special. The thing is, Sabrina is just a little bit better than Surge. The only reason she's better than him is because she has three Pokemon instead of just one. Her AI is just completely random, so the Alakazam continues spamming Reflect, and I get a critical hit with Dig knocking it out. With that, Squirtle only has one last gym leader to defeat, and it's Giovanni. He should be very easy because I have access to Surf. Well, unless the Dugtrio moves first and uses Sand Attack, that's a terrible opening to this fight. I miss on the Persian with Ice Beam, it gets set up with double team, making things worse for me. I have a 43% chance to hit. Note here that I am going for Withdraw, boosting my defense. I know that I'm going to miss at some point and take damage. I would rather have as many boosts as possible for when that happens. 
The Persian negates this by hitting two slashes, taking Squirtle down to red health, so I'll probably just get knocked out when Giovanni attacks anyways. I take it out, move on to the Nidoqueen, because it doesn't have double team setup, I have a higher chance of hitting it. How much damage will Surf do? And the answer is enough, so the Nidoqueen goes down, and because of that the Nidoking is also going to go down, and as we would expect, the Rhydon will go down if I hit, but of course this is where I miss. But Giovanni goes for Fury Attack. Squirtle shrugs it off, and in doing so it has beaten all of the gyms. I thought the battle against the rival on Route 22 was going to be fairly straightforward, that I could set up Withdraw on the Sandslash and then sweep his team, but the Sandslash is dealing a lot of damage with Slash, so I only get to plus 4 before I decide to sweep. Ice Beam one-shots the Execute, the Cloister is locked into Supersonic and it misses, so I move on to the Magneton with my fingers crossed, because Dig needs to one-shot, and in this case, it does. Because of my badge boost, I move first against the Kadabra, finishing it, and the final Flareon is not a match for Squirtle. Just before the League, I do one more errand, going to the Power Plant to grab a final rare candy. And now, Squirtle is ready for the Elite Four. As the fight against Lorelei starts, I want to check in with Bulbasaur and Charmander's first playthrough results. The grass type had a final real time of 1 hour 7 minutes and 27 seconds, whereas the fire type had 1 hour 8 minutes and 30 seconds. With the clock approaching 1 hour and 6 minutes, it looks like Squirtle is going to be the worst of the three starters in its first run. And that's where I need to come clean. I have been calling this Squirtle's first playthrough, but last year I did two playthroughs with Squirtle which went unreleased on the channel. I got too swamped with work and then I upgraded my overlay, the footage looked really bad, and I decided not to release it. When I came back to approach Squirtle this year, I really couldn't remember anything from that first run, so I just went in blind to this one and tried to do it like it was a first run. That being said, there's probably some subconscious level where I had a bit more information for Squirtle, and in the context of that, I think that it's under performance is very shocking. But we still don't know what the final time is, so let's talk about Lorelei and its particular challenges here. Honestly, it doesn't really have many. I can set up with Withdraw on the Dugong, and from there Surf is doing decent damage even when it's resisted just because of how many badge boosts I have. I make it to the Jinx, use Dig for physical damage, and then against the Lapras I hit with Surf doing about a third. Its Body Slam does very little. I go for Dig, taking it to Red. It confuses Squirtle, but this uses my attack stat against my defense stat, so self-inflicted damage isn't doing much. Because of that, I am able to defeat Lorelei on my first attempt. In yesterday's video, I actually had to speak the next trainer's name, but today, with Squirtle, I don't think I'm going to have to. It has Dig for Agatha, which is really going to help against the Ghosts. I decided setting up here with Withdraw probably made the most sense to boost my speed so that I'll at least move first. What I was forgetting is the fact that Squirtle is going to level up very soon. Also, the first Gengar does no Mega Drain, and it gets a crit, taking me down to red health. It also chooses Mega Drain again on the next turn, and Squirtle faints. Changing my approach in the next fight, I try to go for Dig right away, and then Gengar hits a crit with Mega Drain. Yeah, that's not good. While I do knock the Gengar out, the following Golbat uses Toxic against Squirtle, and since I'm relying on Dig and I have no recovery, that's another loss. If I use Withdraw twice, then I have enough speed to move first against the initial Gengar. Problem is, it just Mega Drains constantly while I set up. I knock it out with Dig, hit the Golbat with Ice Beam, it just barely survives, triggering a Super Potion, so I do knock it out for free. This is where Squirtle levels up, and it resets my speed so that I'm slower than the Haunter. It's a really bad spot to level up in the battle. The ghost moves first with Confuse Ray, Squirtle hits itself, I'm having to use Dig. Luckily, my next one hits, knocking it out. I snap out of Confusion on the Arbok, taking it to red health. Agatha uses a Super Potion, and I finish it with Surf. Alright, it's looking like this is going to be the fight. The final Gengar uses Confuse Ray, my Dig still hits, but her Pokemon hangs on. She uses a Super Potion, Squirtle hits itself, Gengar uses Hypnosis, Squirtle does wake up right away, but then the Gengar hits with Psychic, and that's a third loss. I've saved a total of 8 rare candies, if I use 7 of them now, Squirtle is definitely going to be better prepared against the middle Pokemon on her team. Now it outspeeds the Golbat, the Haunter, and the Arbok without any badge boosts. Also, because I used rare candies right before the fight, I'm not going to have a mid-fight level up. As a result, I can set up with badge boosts on the first Gengar and retain these throughout the rest of the fight. This fight is still a little bit frustrating because Agatha paralyzes Squirtle. Ugh, 
just ridiculously annoying. I guess I am still slower than all of her Pokemon. Despite the status condition, I still make it back to the Gengar. It confuses Squirtle, I'm paralyzed, it hits Psychic, gets a crit, and Squirtle faints. Okay, so uh, in the next fight, I make it back to the Gengar. Still paralyzed, still confused. I snap out, go underground with Dig. Ah, uh, I'm paralyzed, of course. But that is actually a good thing, because in Generation 1, if you're paralyzed and you can't move while using Dig or Fly, the invulnerability from being underground is never reset. That means that Agatha can no longer hit my Squirtle with any of her moves. And so there's no way for Squirtle to fail getting at least one Dig in. Of course, because when I use Dig, I'll come up from underground and that does reset the invulnerability flag. But one Dig is all I need, so finally Agatha is defeated. Alright, I'm ready for an easy fight. That one was pretty brutal. Squirtle has over an hour and 11 minutes on the clock now. Lance is next, and I expect that this will be fairly straightforward. I get good luck right away, because Ice Beam freezes the Gyarados, so I can just take it out for free using Surf, because in Generation 1, there is no chance to defrost. Dragonair number 1 goes down to a single Ice Beam, so the second one is also a one-hit. That leads to Aerodactyl. It is going to move first, because I didn't set up. Even if I had against the Gyarados, I still wouldn't have my badge boost here because I just leveled up, which in this case is not nice. Aerodactyl hits with Hyper Beam, but Squirtle survives, and Ice Beam takes it to red. I get one more turn though, so I can use Surf and finish it off. All that remains is Dragonite, but of course it is a one hit, and with that, Squirtle has made it to the champion. Prior to this fight, I used one rare candy, so I'm not going to have any mid-battle level ups. That means I feel safe to set up against the Sand Slash. Well, sort of safe. If he uses Slash, it will do a lot of damage to me. And then he uses Poison Sting and Poison Squirtle which is really unfortunate, especially because I don't have a recovery move. I knock his lead out with Surf. Against the Alakazam, I really didn't want to use Dig and take more poison damage, but this thing just keeps using Recover and Squirtle goes down. I would have won that fight if I had Rest on my set. This is one reason I really love this move for the champion in yellow version. Plus, I can set up on the Sand Slash for a longer period of time. At plus three, I decide to knock it out and move on to the Alakazam. I go for Dig, knocking it out in one turn, and then things slow down against the Executive. Tor. Because of its AI, it's only going to spam Leech Seed against me. Eventually, I finish it off using Surf. Magneton faints to a single dig, which is a rare occurrence. Thank you, critical hit. Cloister's next. It can get annoying if it crits with Spike Cannon, but in this case, it doesn't, so I'm able to knock it out with three uses of Surf. All that remains is Flareon. I go for Surf, and it goes down to a single hit. So Squirtle clocks in with the worst time of the three starters in its first playthrough. It has a real time of 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 54 seconds. 14 resets, it finished the game at level 70, and this is a game time of 4 hours and 24 minutes. The split data with all these playthroughs shows us how these Pokémon relate to each other. Squirtle and Bulbasaur seem the most similar in the early portions of the game. However, out of the three Pokémon, Squirtle is the one that struggles the most against Koga. That was definitely the biggest wall for it in this playthrough, and it's going to be the thing that I need to solve for my second run. Outside of that split, Squirtle performed quite well against all of the other trainers, with the exception of Agatha, but I don't really think there is that much I can do against her. Another piece of information that I find really interesting from this playthrough is that if we compare levels by trainer, Squirtle is the Pokemon that finished the game at the highest level of the three starters. It's no surprise to me that Bulbasaur finished at the lowest level, after all it gets Sleep Powder, but I really thought that Charmander would have needed to finish the game at a higher level. Of course, as I said, this is first playthrough results, so now let's get into Squirtle's follow-up playthrough and see how I was able to optimize it. For this optimized playthrough, I want to say a huge thanks to Austin for helping me optimize it it was really helpful. We'll start by jumping ahead to Brock, and here you'll notice that my Squirtle is level 12. I really did consider cutting a lot of training out of the early game, but it just doesn't make that much sense. On Route 3, I continue with this philosophy, battling the Bug Catcher rather than the Lass. He gives slightly better experience. Then in Mount Moon, I take on the Super Nerd, as well as the Rocket down the stairs, because in my first run, I forgot to pick up Mega Punch. This move would have been really helpful. Anyways, I'm gonna learn Mega Punch now. I'm sure a lot of you have already made comments about it. 
so you can all go and edit those comments now saying that I address it later in the video. I also defeat the Hiker because his team is very fast experience for Squirtle. This brings it to level 20 just before Misty. Also I'm going to level up to 21 once I defeat the Staryu, which gives me slightly more health for the Star Me. In the entire run, I think that this is the scariest battle for Squirtle. I really wanted to get through this fight without a reset. Every time I did another Squirtle playthrough, I assumed that I would get at least one reset here. If I got more than one, I would just restart the run and try again. The accelerant that can really help against Misty is a critical hit with Mega Punch. Eventually I do get one, taking it down to red health, and I finish it off with no resets. By the way, this is where Squirtle learns Bite, but I wasn't going to use it against Misty anyways because Mega Punch deals much more damage. With Bubble Beam, everything on Nugget Bridge becomes way faster. Note here I did forget Mega Punch. That's a misclick. Don't worry about it. I had done a bunch of Squirtle playthroughs this day, and I was so frustrated that I beat Misty without a reset and then unlearned Mega Punch. In the end, it doesn't really affect the route that much because the SSN is next. I am going to get Rest here. It'll be useful later on for the champion. Just to cover what the risks are against Surge, Dig is going to be a two hit and Thunderbolt is going to be a one hit if he chooses to use it. That being said, wasting time trying to be more consistent here never makes sense. One reset is very fast, it's okay. In this case though, I don't even get one, so I beat Surge, no resets so far. However, that changes immediately after when I face the Wrapping Lass. The Oddish uses Stun Spore, this is the first Oddish, so I just reset right away and try the fight again. In the next fight I do a different strategy, it's just as viable as the one I was doing last time. Setting up Withdraw once gives Dig an 88% chance to knock out the first and second Oddish, it's still not a guarantee and the first Oddish takes two turns no matter what you do. In this case though it pays off for me and Squirtle has defeated her. Alright, throughout the mid game we are going to talk about optional trainers. First of all, on my way to Celadon City I fight this super nerd, he has great experience. Then I go into the rocket hideout and I do the fast route here picking up only one PP up and then the rare candy. After that I dig out and I only have enough money to buy two Carbos, but that's all that Squirtle needs. I teach it Ice Beam right away in the place of Body Slam, correcting my mistake from the first playthrough, and then let's watch a fight against Jesse and James in Pokemon Tower. This fight was very problematic for me in my first run, but this time it luckily is not. I one shot the Arbok with Dig. Weezing's next. Dig does more than half. It hits Sludge and I knock it out. Alright, that's sweet revenge for giving me the setback last time. Then on Cycling Road I fight optional trainers. The guy with four Grimers, the guy with the Weezing's, two fighting type trainers which are right by the grass patch, this guy with two Voltorbs. By the way, you have to save in front of this fight because the Voltorbs are faster than Squirtle and self-destruct does a lot. After him there's a Viker with two fighting types, and then the guy with all of the coughing and wheezing. Continuing my training in Saffron City, I fight the fighting dojo trainers. The dojo master requires a save, as you are going to see in this battle. Turn 1 he uses an X attack on Hitmonlee, and then goes for Rolling Kick because it is going to survive a hit from Squirtle. This does half. If it gets a critical hit, or attacks twice, Squirtle can have a reset here. Luckily though in this run I don't. I'm going to continue my training in Sylph with a lot of trainers. You're going to see a slow montage of all of them on screen with their teams right now. The reason I'm doing all this training is because I want Squirtle to be level 50 right before Koga. At which point I will be able to use 7 rare candies and cut all additional trainers from the remaining game. In Sylph I am specifically targeting trainers that are going to give me enough experience to be exactly level 45 by the time I take on the rival. The strategy against him here is quite interesting. I'm going to knock the Sand Slash out right away with Surf and move on to the Cloister. Against it I'm going to need to be able to set up Withdraw twice so that Dig will one hit the Magneton. This does expose Squirtle to Supersonic, but Withdraw is basically countering Supersonic anyways because as I raised my defense, the self-inflicted damage gets minimized. Notably, I will continue using Withdraw until I snap out of Confusion, then I'm going to use Surf to knock the Cloister out. If it confuses Squirtle again, I will just continue setting up until I am no longer confused, and then knock the Cloister out. I really don't want to have a status condition going up against the Magneton, because if it paralyzes me with Thundershock or crits, the fight can fall apart. After all, I am not faster than the Kadabra. Without confusion, Dig one-shots the Magneton, Kadabra's next, it just goes for Disable, so I finish it in one turn, and Flareon is easy to clean up. Now that I finish Sylph, I stay in Saffron City and journey to Copycat's house to pick up the TM for Mimic. This is going to be very important soon. Next I go to Erica's gym and here I'm going to fight the last optional trainers of the entire playthrough. The Beauty with four Pokemon by the door, the Junior Trainer by the Cut Tree, 
the last by the cut tree, the cool trainer with amazing experience yields, and the execute trainer who is usually the mandatory battle. After that I save the game, this is required for Erica, because no, even at level 48 she is not a guarantee. Ice Beam has a 79% chance to one hit the Tangela, and a 93% chance to one hit the Weeping Bell, but I don't want to take chances with it, because if it survives and uses sleep power, things can get very bad. And in this case it does survive, demonstrating the fact that it can. Luckily she just super potions it and I knock it out for free. In Koga's Gym, I fight the two optional trainers, and then against the final juggler, when I defeat his Hypno and Drowsy, I level up to exactly level 50. As you can see in my inventory, I have exactly 7 rare candies, so I'm going to use all of them now to go up to level 57. But my preparation isn't over because I'm going to teach Mimic to Squirtle in the place of Ice Beam. This gives me an incredibly consistent Koga battle. On turn 1, I can Mimic Psychic from the first Venonat. It is going to put Squirtle to sleep, exposing me to a possible loss if it uses Psychic and lower Squirtle's special. In this case it doesn't, once I wake up I can start using Psychic to knock out Koga's Pokemon, I have guaranteed 1 hits on every single Venonat, and a guaranteed 2 hit on the Venomoth. Today it just spams double team, which is not very smart. It could have done between 24 and 29% damage to me if it had attacked with Psychic, but even then it wouldn't be doing enough to finish Squirtle off, and because of those damage ranges I felt comfortable with this fight. So in my second run, Squirtle has no resets to Koga. Up next is Blaine, and I do want to mention here that I'm going to use two rare candies from 57 up to 59. This doesn't seem to make sense because he's a fire type gym leader, but of the mid game battles, he is one of the more scary fights for Squirtle. These rare candies dramatically change the battle because now I outspeed the Ninetales. Even with doing that, just watch how this fight goes, his Rapidash does a lot of damage, taking Squirtle down to orange health, and I could have lost there if the Arcanine had attacked. Luckily for me it just uses Reflect and I knock it out. Also note during that fight I did use plus one with Withdraw, just to outspeed the rest of Blaine's Pokemon. Okay, Sabrina is random, I don't really know what to say, yeah, sometimes she wins, but it's quite rare. In this case, she doesn't. I fight minimum battles in Viridian City Gym and then I go up against Giovanni. You might think that with a level 60 Squirtle he would be trivial, but that is not the case. I'm gonna one hit the Dugtrio, but it can knock me out with Fissure or use Sand Attack. It can also crit with Dig or Earthquake. Then the Persian is gonna be a two hit, so it can deal damage with Slash and be really annoying. Both of the Nidos are not one hit. I have a 74% chance on the Nido Queen and a 58% chance on the Nido King. Once I make it by them, it's a sure victory as long as I don't get a Gen 1 miss. In this case, I don't. So that's the gym challenge, only one reset to the wrapping last. Things are going very well for Squirtle. Its time right now is just over 45 minutes. The rival battle on Route 22 is largely the same as the one in Sylph. I taught Squirtle Blizzard in the place of Mimic just so I can one-shot the Execute and bypass Stun Spore. With it down I only need one withdraw against the Cloister to one-shot the Magneton as well as move first against the Kadabra. I am going to take my time to stall out Confusion though, just to ensure that I don't have a status condition. I've also planned out my experience during this section of the game with those candies right before Blaine, so that I will level up after the final Pokemon in this fight, ensuring that Squirtle moves first against the Kadabra. Okay, so let's jump into the league. I leveled up right after the rival on Route 20 so I will not have a level up during the Lorelei fight, which is perfect because then I can set up fully with Withdraw and not lose my badge boosts. That means in the next room I have my level up going into the Hitmonchan, and then I use one rare candy before Agatha to ensure that I don't lose my badge boosts here. Of all the fights in the run, this is the one that has the potential to waste the most time for Squirtle, and it comes late in the run, and unfortunately for me today, I get poisoned by the Golbat, and I'm not going to be able to win as a result. Luckily for me though, that is a fairly fast reset. I come back in, get set up to plus two, which is what I need for Dig to one shot, and then I sweep Agatha's team. I use one rare candy in front of Lance to ensure no mid-battle level ups here as well, and then I set up Withdraw on the Gyarados. It does have a chance to use Leer, which can accelerate your badge boosting process. I'm just trying to move faster than the Aerodactyl so that it doesn't crit me. Once I have enough speed, I sweep through his team, use one more rare candy just before the champion, and then for the final fight, I have finally taught Squirtle rest in the place of Blizzard. This fight is the same as it was last time, fairly straightforward, set up as much as possible on the Sand Slash, sweep through the Alakazam, then heal and complete setup on the Executor, knock the Magneton out with a single dig, surf down the Cloister, and surf down the Flareon. All of this gives Squirtle a final time of 54 minutes and 24 seconds, with two resets at level 67. This is a game time of 3 hours and 33 minutes. I've officially finished playthroughs for all three of the starters now, so let's go through all the data. The first thing that should stick 
stick out about the splits table is the fact that I took four runs with Bulbasaur to get my final time, although I did attempt a fifth. With Squirtle, it took five in total. There was no sixth attempt. And with Charmander, I took a total of eight and even attempted a ninth but failed to beat my personal best. The metric of attempt number demonstrates that Bulbasaur is by far the most intuitive to play, and that is going beyond the fact that in my first playthrough it was able to achieve the best result of the three. Things are more complicated as I examine Charmander and Squirtle together. While Charmander outperformed in its first playthrough, Squirtle ended up outperforming overall. From the data and experience that I have collected, this really comes down to the fact that Squirtle is just far more consistent. Charmander really isn't, and it requires a lot of luck late into the game. I personally wanted Bulbasaur's time to be a little bit lower as well as Charmander's, but by my final Squirtle attempt I was quite happy with the result I had achieved. I think it's possible to push all of these times lower, most significantly Charmander. That being said, to do so requires a lot of luck. Next year I'm going to find a way to incorporate the attempt number metric in my evaluation of Pokemon, because while Charmander may eventually be able to be faster than Squirtle, I just don't think it's fair to rank it ahead of Squirtle when Squirtle is by far far more consistent. I will admit that part of me was really scared about Charmander clocking in with a faster time than Squirtle. If that had happened, I think it would have had to go against my feelings and rank it ahead of the water type, but in the end, it didn't happen. So let's bring up the tier list. Today, Squirtle's results earn itself a placement at the very end of the B tier, just behind Kadabra. I'm sure all of the Charmander diehards are going to give me a lot of comments saying that I didn't do it right or I didn't try hard enough. That's fine, I guess. I will accept your judgment, but I did do nine playthroughs with the thing. I really tried. So that's it for the Generation 1 first stage starters. I hope you've enjoyed this small mini-series, and now I have released five Pokemon Yellow videos on the channel in a row, so I think it's time we go to a different game. Daily December continues tomorrow when I play Pokemon Crystal using Ursaring and Dawnfan. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. If you made it this far, you're incredible, and here is a treat. I'm going to beat Professor Oak with Squirtle. Of the three starters, Squirtle by far has it the easiest. That's mostly because of the level it finished the game at. I have just gone over the threshold to level 67. Also, it knows Withdraw, which can badge boost its defense stat. As the Tauros uses Tail Whip or Leer, it also badge boosts me, and I just continue setting up until my attack stat, special stat and speed stat are all 999. I hope I don't need to tell you that this makes Squirtle absolutely broken. With Surf, I can one-hit Tauros. I can also use Surf to one-hit the level 67 Executor. Of course, it knocks the Arcanine out, and surprisingly, it also knocks Venusaur out. All that's left is Gyarados, and while Surf doesn't get the one-hit here, the water type just uses Leer, and I finish it off. With that knockout, Squirtle defeats Professor Oak, and that's curtains for this small starter series.